Now we've got the recap session tonight, so normally that's three sessions because I run them every four to try and ma mainly to patch you in if you miss something in the lesson or if you actually weren't here. So it's trying to cover everything. I have four subjects this this week, uh, week this month because um, I'm not very good at getting up seven. Those of you who were here on the 29th of July might then miss a, my sheet, Mr. A, a block, so I slotted something in. Hence why we've got four subjects rather than three. So I'm going to try and cover them fairly here, so otherwise we'll be here for the majority of the, of the, of the evening. Um, I'll start, I don't think they're actually in chronological order, I think that one was the oldest and the yeah. one. Anyway, uh, yeah, just continue things a bit more. Um, so I'll start with semi-balanced hands and work my way down. Now, semi-balanced hands are hands that are neither truly balanced nor unbalanced, hence the term semi-balanced. Um, now when I first taught you about balanced or semi-balanced hands, sorry, balanced or unbalanced hands, um, I'll have talked to you about two doubletons is an unbalanced hand and anything that has more than that, i.e. a singleton or more than two doubletons is unbalanced. And if you only have one doubleton or no doubletons at all, you are considered balanced. So essentially I drew a line down the middle somewhere and said these hands are balanced, these hands are unbalanced, and then taught you how to bid these hands and how to bid these hands. The truth is that actually there is a sort of a segment in the middle, some probably 5% to 10%-ish of hands that are aren't strictly balanced nor unbalanced. And that is when you have exactly two doubletons. The reason, I, I mean, we would treat this as unbalanced if you weren't treating semi-balanced as its own creature, if you like. But the reason it isn't really unbalanced is because it is quite close to a balanced hand. It is about as close as you can get without it being truly balanced. For example, if I just move that club there, the hand has hardly, if at all, changed. Yes, it has changed, but you can see how those two hands are very similar. See how they're quite similar. If I move another card somewhere, it starts to become either very unbalanced or very balanced, depending on what you do. So there is this kind of, if you like, a grey area between the black and the white. So what I said was, consider treating these semi-balanced hands as balanced rather than unbalanced. So right at the very sort of introduction to bidding, I would have said two doubletons, that's an unbalanced hand, which means you have to bid suit then suit. So in this case, one club then two clubs would say six plus clubs. And that was kind of it. I just sort of drew a line under it and in my head I knew I was so, sort of half ignoring that you could do something different. So the introduction of semi-balanced hands says that you could treat these hands as balanced, but you need to meet a couple of conditions. The first thing is that your semi-balanced nature doesn't consist of much major, much major? Many major cards. So you don't have a long major. If you've got a long major, for example if that club suit was hearts, you should really be bidding hearts twice because it's more important to get across a six card major than it is to try and force these semi-balanced hands into a balanced hand. Given that our six card suit is a minor, we're not particularly enthralled with clubs as trumps. Yes, we would prefer clubs as trumps as any other suit, but we don't mind no trumps either. So treating semi-balanced hands as balanced, first condition really is that you have a minor hand rather than a major hand. And the second condition is that your doubletons are not very poor. Because if you have poor doubletons, you will be, if you like, get caught for having this semi-balanced hand and treating it as balanced. Because here we have goodies-ish in the doubleton suits, half of our points are in the doubleton suits, our short suits. It also lends itself to being treated as balanced. So essentially trying to force this, if you like, hexagonal peg, you've got a round hole or a square hole, which one do you want to force it into is, is the way I'm seeing it. If your doubleton values are good and you have a minory hand, consider treating them as balanced. So in this instance, there are two ways to bid this opening hand. You can either bid one club <coughs> and then follow it up with two clubs. Obviously that's if allowed, it might go one club, one spade, four spades, and then that's it, isn't it? <laughs> or you could, because of your point and your balanced nature, open one no drop. That is not strictly speaking the truth but it has advantages on opening one club, two clubs. Opening one club then rebidding two clubs is very clubby and your hand isn't all about clubs. And also, if you end up in two clubs, one no trump probably would have been a better contract. I can't promise that, but probably. Because your points are fairly evenly split, one no trump will score better. Tying into what I'll talk about shortly, match point repairs, no trump scores better than clubs and diamonds. So if you can manage to manifest the contract in a safe-ish manner in no trumps, it often scores you better than being in a minor. That's why you need a minor hand. If I sort of modify them a little bit, 
and make it minory but in a slightly different way. Let's move the swap the queen and king and give us some length but in a different sort of manifestation. Now our hand is still minory, but we now are two suited rather than single suited. I'm now even more incentivized to open this one no trump rather than opening one club. The reason for that is your rebid is quite awkward with five clubs, four diamonds. Because they open the, you open the club, they often bid one heart or one spade. Then your rebid is two diamonds, which is actually going past two of your original suit. And often you will end up in a high level, high-ish level minor contract, when really one no trump would have been just fine. The other advantage to opening no trumps is that you have transfers and statements. You have all your fancy, if you like, sophisticated systems that enable you to be able to land in the correct contract more frequently. So if you can open no trumps, you should really be looking to do so, unless you have this major. If I was to give us a couple more points, let's say an extra king, through the power of being on the board, now you can't open it one no trump because you've got too many points. But because of our semi-balanced nature, I would still be thinking about trying to get no trumps in. So at one club, one whatever heart, let's say, I would now be thinking about rebidding one no trump. Again, treating it as balanced, but in the next bracket up. You see that? So instead of being 12-14, now we're at 15-17. But I'm still thinking about it as a balanced hand, because my hand is so minor. Okay? Make those hearts and spades, and I would never treat it as balanced. I would bid spades and hearts, or hearts and spades, depending on which was my longer suit. Okay? Right. Pick. I'd like to think I wouldn't forget, but you never know. Alright, gambling three no trumps. Um, this one's quite an exciting subject. I hope you found so anyway. Um, a hand that doesn't come up very often, but is really kind of <coughs> good fun when it does. <laughs> Hang on, let me just sort of yeah. what's his name? What's his name? Sundance Kid. Who is it in the Sundance Kid? Butch Cassidy. Butch Cassidy, thank you. That's the good, the bad, the old I know, I know. <laughs> My favourite one is the uh, <laughs> the <laughs> Eli um, <laughs> So, gambling three no trumps. Um, essentially, it's just a long minor that you would preempt with normally. So, if I was to make that diamond suit slightly worse and say it's king, queen, jack to seven, you would just open three diamonds. Nothing fancy really without being preempted bid, although they are still good fun. I still enjoy them even to this day. Um, now, gambling three no trumps relies upon your suit being running, i.e. you will go ace, then king, then queen, then blah, 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 all the way down your suit, and you will not, it's basically a zero loser suit. It has to be a minor, because if it were a major, you should be bidding it as a major. So very similar to the semi-balanced hands, you don't do weird things with major hands, you just be normal with major hands, because you need to get the majors involved. With a long-running minor, if you were to gain the lead with this hand, and no trumps was the kind of main suit, suit, then you would make a lot of tricks. That's the idea. You would make seven of them, unless the diamonds broke very, very poorly. So with seven tricks in your hand, three no trumps is not an unreachable target. So the gambling three no trumps functions on that suit being long and running, and you open, instead of opening three diamonds, you would open three no trumps, and it's agreed between the two of you that when you make an opening bit of three no trumps, it isn't a really, really, really good balanced hand, because if it was, you would open two clubs. Instead, it's this gambling style bid, where you've got a long running minor and nothing else, basically. The highest card outside your suit should be a queen, no higher than a queen, because then you should just be opening one of your suit like normal. So by opening three no trumps, you're telling your partner, long running minor, Nap all else, basically. They can now decide whether they leave you in three no trumps and let you have a go, i.e. run the risk, roll the dice, if you will, or they can decide to remove that three no trumps into a four level minor contract. They will nearly always know whether it's diamonds or clubs based on how many diamonds or clubs they have, or whether they have a big card in them. Because they know it's a running suit, if they had, let's say, the king of clubs, they know that you can't have running clubs because your clubs don't run without the king, so they know you've got diamonds in that instance. What I'm trying to say really is the responder almost always knows which suit it is. Almost always. If you're unsure, you bid four clubs and they bid four diamonds if it's diamonds anyway, so that's fine. So if, if the responder wants to remove, they just bid four of a minor. If they want to let, it, let you have a go at three no trumps, they pass. Now the way this works is it's like a double edged sword. You either get your preempting by bidding your partner bids four diamonds and then they've now got to make a decision at the four level. That's good because it's a preemptive bid, you've kind of got to set their bidding. Or your partner thinks, actually I've got sort of 12, 13 points, I'll let them have a go at that three no trumps because I don't think they're going to take us off because of my partner's long running suit. 
So an example of a hand like that is where you've got little bits here, there, and everywhere. Obviously not in the long running suit though, because you can't have anything there. Yeah. Aces. Aces are really good because you manage to gain the lead very quickly. Um, I don't know. Jack down to four, eight. And I've got some. That's probably about. Mm, the are a bit dodgy, but yeah, it'll be alright. Uh, so, oh, hang on, I've got enough cards. I keep suffering from this curse. I'm having, I'm having 12 card hands. Um, so, partner over three no trumps, East passes, let's say. You've actually got <coughs> a decent ish holding in each of the suits. You don't think the opponents are really going to harm you greatly in any of the suits. A spade lead may well cause the defence to be able to take some tricks. And it might be the three no trumps is going off, especially if the ace queen of hearts is here. Mm -hmm. That would be quite bad if they manage to somehow communicate between the two of them to lead a heart through and come back and so on and so forth. But should your side gain the lead, you would think nine tricks on top is fairly routine. Your partner seven diamonds and your two black aces. That seems fairly realistic. Because you could rely on them to have running diamonds, emphasis on the word running, no ace king to five or anything dodgy like that. You need ace king, queen, jack, asterisk, if you don't have the jack, you know, I feel like it's up to you. Um, and that's about it. So your partner thinks, well, they've got seven tricks, I've got two. Three no trumps is actually a realistic contract because of the solid, this kind of solid suit. Here, you've got 14 points opposite. Oh, that's not very good. That's yeah. a normal three no trumps. Let's say that one. Here, you've got 12 points opposite 11. So you might not reach this three no trumps if you were kind of to use traditional methods, if you like. But because of the long running diamonds, actually, you can make three no trumps fairly routinely. I, I can't see a way for the defence to actually harm you because your hearts are too good and you, you've got stoppers, certain stoppers in, in clubs and in spades. So unless the diamonds are 5-0, which would be quite unlucky, wouldn't it? 3 no trumps should be making. So the idea behind 3 no trumps really is you've got a long running minor and you've got nothing else and you open 3 no trumps. There is another option. I'm going to be king of hearts. Oh. If you have something outside of your suit, you can make a gambling 3 no trumps bid, but on your second round of bidding instead of your first. So you open one of your suit like normal, your partner responds, I hope, like normal, and then you jump to 3 no trumps as your second bid rather than your primary bid. This can't be a strong balanced hand, because if it was a strong balanced hand, it would either be one no trump, which is 15 to 17, or two no trumps, which is 18 or 19. And if it was higher than 18, 19, it would be 20, in which case you would have already opened two no trumps. So this doesn't actually exist as a strong, strong balanced hand. Hence, you can use it as a gambling three no trumps as well. All I've done really is you make that you go, oh, I've got a gambling three no trumps. Oh no, I've got a card outside. It's a strange thing to not want a card outside, but you can still do the gambling three no trumps thing. You must open the bidding normally first to let your partner know you don't have nothing outside of your suit. These are more infrequent because it means that you have that suit and something outside and you get to be in the bidding because it might go one diamond, one spade, pass, three spades, there. So these are less frequent but you can still do it. If you do get that solid mind you can still have a punt essentially at three no trumps. Okay. But what if hearts had the five cards? If it, say the ace was in, in the heart because then you've got a... You've got a sort of oh, a spade problem? No, no, you've got a... <coughs> they would bid one heart. Oh, I see, and then you missed the heart. Well, then, and then what do you? What would you? What I would still take. I was. Uh, yeah, I, I, I said to your point there. Um, you could take a flyer at three n. There is a, obviously a spade issue here. Or the problem with sort of punting three n now is that you might miss a heart fit, as as you do have. I think I probably still would just have to take a flyer at three n. Mm -hmm. It might be that you know, and your partner does also know what you're doing, so they might well remove. But they're in a bit of an awkward position. If they lead a spade, you need spades to be. 4-4, four, four, basically. So it's not a great three neutrals. I would still take a flyer. It's sad because you missed a half there. You might actually, you probably would take four hours in this one. Yeah, that's not good. There are, there are downsides to it. Yeah. I think because these hands come up so infrequently, when I get one, I'm just going to do it. It <laughs> works or it doesn't. Most of the time, it tends to be fairly, fairly good. Yeah. Okay? Um, defending yeah. these gambling three neutrals, <laughs> double is penalties. Bidding your own suit is a very good suit because you're bidding at the four level. You're always having to bid at the four level. That's why these bids are quite double-edged, really, because they're preemptive and also potentially making, depending on what's going on. Um, and if you double them initially, it's penalties. If you pass and wait for them to run to whatever minor they do, and then you double, that's takeout. 
So if you want your partner to bid, bide your time. If you want to try and take them off because you've got six running tricks or something, double them. Be aware that whenever you double the opponent's for penalties, you are sort of telling them that they're in a bad contract. But you are telling them. You're going, you have made the wrong decision. Now, either you are wrong, in which case that's bad news, or you've told them that they're in a bad contract and they run, which is bad news as well. So penalty doubles, whilst they are good, you are alerting them to the problem that they've got. So just be aware that it might be correct just to sit there as like a shark underneath the water, if you will. Okay? Right. Now, there isn't much to be said on match point pairs, unless I do the whole diagram, for those of you who are here, you have like a, a big diagram of they got this score, they got this score, which would take me quite a considerable amount of time. Um, so what I would say really, just to kind of a, a brief touch on match point pairs, if you think you're in a contract that most other people are in, it's all about who gets the best score. So for those of you who are here, uh, you'll remember I did some match pointing where you can kind of your absolute score of plus 400 gets converted into a rank. So they put all the scores in one order. You've got the best score, you've got the second best, you've got the joint third best, and you've got the worst or whatever. And then you get a point for where you finish in the rank. So if you get the best score, even if it's 10 points more than everyone else in the room, you get absolute top, which means you get 100% of the match points. So it's not about making your contract necessarily. Obviously making your contract is a good thing, because if you make your contract, you get a plus score, which is obviously likely over averages to lead you to a good score. But if you're in three hearts and you can see nine tricks, it means that everyone else who is in three hearts can also see nine tricks. So making nine tricks does not mean you will get a good score because your score is going to be pitted against everyone else's in the room. So if you think you're in the same contract or a reasonable contract, i.e. you've not been silly, you need to be trying to make more tricks than everyone else. Match point of scoring is focusing more on the trick taking than it is on the bidding. Obviously bidding is relevant because if you end up in the wrong, co wrong contract you're going to be in trouble. Might be you so when you're, in a match, when you're in a contract of let's say one no trump and you've got 12 points and they've got 9 and you know that almost everybody will be in one no trump it's all about the tricks you take. Take risks to try and get extra tricks. Don't think, oh I hate one no trump, I've got 7 tricks, thank god I'll take my 7 tricks. Because everybody else in that one no trump will also have those seven tricks. So you're actually not doing anything. If everyone's got seven tricks and you make seven tricks, you've not actually achieved anything at all, if you think about it, because everyone else also had those seven. And those who were greedy with that diamond finesse or whatever and made eight, they've got a better score than you. And it's about absolute rank. It's not about the absolute score. So you could get a bottom with 2,000 points. You could get a top with minus 50. So it's all about the absolute rank. So it's about thinking about what everyone else will be doing in the room, rather than your, your thing. It's quite hard to do that, because when you look at it, you go, oh god, I hate no trumps. Oh, I've just about scraped home in three no trumps. Oh, everyone else made three no trumps plus three. <coughs> What's happening? You've got to think about not just your hand, but everyone else playing the same hand. All right? Now, 14 defense. This one, um, uh, unsurprisingly, to do with defending, um, it's when you know that declare is trumping something, and you shouldn't necessarily be put off leading them again. So let's come up with some kind of hand. Um. Oh, this is really good. North is the declarer in some hard contracts. So this is the hidden hand for us, East is the defender. Now obviously I'm going to show you the hidden hand, but you wouldn't have that information. If you did, you'd be a very good defender if you could <laughs> see it on that all the time. So I'm going to show you, but obviously we wouldn't actually know in inverted commas this. But the thing to think here really is making declarer trump in their long holding is not a net positive for declarer. So when you, when you learn about declare play, you learn about trumping in the dummy, trumping in the short holding. <coughs> I'm always talking about that. Whenever I do that subject, I must say it a thousand times. Can you trump in the short holding? Can you trump in the short holding? I never say, can you trump in the long holding? Because trumping in the long holding is not good for declarer. 
It's not necessarily bad, but it doesn't get you any extra tricks. So when I'm talking about making more tricks as a declarer, I'm referring to roughing in the short holding. Therefore, as a defender, you should try and stop them from roughing in the short holding, and you don't mind them roughing in the long holding. So what a forcing defence refers to is actually choosing to make them rough in the long holding, to force them to trump in the long holding, which does not gain them tricks. It feels a positive when you're a declarer and you make the three of hearts, but actually you're going to make that through length anyway. So if you take this hand, we're going to leave the ace of spades against whatever number of hearts, six, four, two, one, you're always going to leave the ace of spades. I'd like to think we wouldn't have let them play in one heart though. Um, and everyone plays a spade. Okay? Hey presto. Now we're human beings, we're going we're gonna to play the king of spades almost all of the time unless we see something very threatening from uh, the dummy, something like jack 10 to 5 or something. Even then you might, might be right too. So play the king of spades um, and declare a rook sit. Now an instinctive thing that you might think is, oh that's sad, my queen of spades isn't going to make. And that's true, your queen of spades isn't going to make. And that's a sad thing that you didn't take ace and king of spades. That's bad for your defence. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't play any more spades. Your instinct might be, before you learn about forcing defence, your instinct might be, well, there's no point playing spades anymore. Actually, that's quite a dangerous pattern of thought because playing spades is not a, bo not a benefit for declarer. So there is no danger in playing spades. It doesn't actually cost you anything. But you might think, well, why would I play spades? Why should I play spades? It's not going to gain me anything. There is a potential for it to gain because your declarer's trumps, sorry, the declarer's trumps are going down and down and down. Every time you make them trump, they're forced into <coughs> making basically a rough they don't want to make. So let's say declarer crosses to the dummy, which is a completely normal thing to do, because what they want to do is draw the trumps. They want to draw the trumps because they can't rough in the dummy, so that seems to stack up. Your partner plays their one and only heart. Now, declarer doesn't know it's their one and only heart, but we do. We know declarer's trumps are breaking badly for them because we're looking at four of them. This also lends itself for a forcing defence. Now, declarer takes the heart finesse. Ha ha, finesse has never worked. <laughs> and we win the queen. Now, you might be thinking, well, diamonds declarer clearly has good cards in because our partner didn't play the ace of diamonds on the king, so it looks like declarer's got ace, king, queen of diamonds, which is true. So diamonds are a no-hoper. Um, clubs, our partner might have something good in clubs. Spades are getting trumps and hearts are their suit. So you could sort of argue, well spades are getting trumps so they're out, hearts are their suit so they're out, diamonds declare has got really good diamonds so they're out, so I have to lead a club. You could go along that path of logic and there is nothing wrong with that, but you've dismissed spades too early. Because if you now lead another spade, you can lead a low one, your partner's got the jack, if you now lead a low spade, you'll be making the declarer rough again. And that is actually a benefit for you because you shorten declarer's trumps from three now down to two, which means you have more trumps than that because the trumps are breaking badly. So by leading a low spade here, declarer doesn't have to rough, of course. But if declarer roughed, going, oh well, as long as the hearts break, I'm okay. I'll play ace, king of hearts and then play all my diamonds. Might be their sort of pattern of thought. You now know, because the hearts are breaking nicely, that force, you force them to rough twice in spades. They've gone from five trumps at the start down to three. They've played one round, so they've got two in their hand, whilst you have three in your hand. Do you see that? So by forcing them to rough, a forcing defence, you've actually generated extra tricks for your side, because you now have trump control. When you lose the trump control as a declarer, things go very badly, very quickly. Because once this person gets in, and let's say you play ace king of hearts going, I hope to God the hearts break, and they don't. Ace king of hearts and they discard something. I, I'm not really, I don't really care about West Ham to be honest, sorry Wes. Um, and then they go, oh no the trumps broke, I'll try and get as many tricks as I can. Diamond to the queen, and the diamond back to the ace. Again, don't really care about West. Um, you trump that. And you can now play winning spades. You can play winning spades because they've run out of trumps. And they've run out of trumps because you made them rough so many times, they actually literally ran out. They had not got enough trumps to keep trumping all of your spades. So the idea behind the forcing defence is make them trump in the long holding, make them trump in the long holding, and if you can, just keep doing so until they actually don't become the person with the longest trumps anymore. It works better when you've got long trumps yourself because it means they run out quicker, if you like, because you've got more of a threat. What I'm trying to say is, 
when you play the ace and then the king and they trump that king, that does not mean that suit is dead for you. It is dead in the sense that they're going to be trumping it, but it doesn't mean it's a bad thing to continue playing it. Here you can see, if you had averted away from spades and instead led clubs, they would have played their ace of clubs on the club, you've now set club tricks up for the declarer, and then declarer plays ace king of hearts, leaves you with your winning heart and plays all their winning minor cards. So it actually is very different for declarer. They lose one, two, three, four tricks, whereas through the forcing defence they lose one, two, three, four, five, six tricks. What a big difference. Just because you force, okay, yes, I have set the hand up, so a forcing defence works. Because you force them to rough, and then when you got in, force them to rough again, you've actually diminished their trumps where they've lost control of the hand. Okay. Really, all I'm saying is, don't be frightened if you declare roughing a suit in the long holding. That can be either in the dummy or in their hand, depending on whether it's a transfer sequence or just a normal bidding sequence. Okay? Mm -hmm. Right, I think that's all. Um, so what I've done is I've put in these hands, match-pointed pairs, it's difficult to create hands now.